This is Nursing Uncensored. I'm your host, Adrienne Benning, and I invite you to listen in on conversations I've had with real nurses about the crazy and wonderful lives we lead. This podcast is meant to create laughter in addition to serious discussion, and nothing is off limits. We're always honest, but we're not always safe for work. Please listen responsibly. Hi, I'm Adrienne. I am here today with um, a friend, a colleague, and a woman who wears many hats. Um, I have known Mackenzie. I actually, I wrote a little something. So rather than looking down and unnatural, I'm going to read my little something here. Um, Not only is she my idea of a perfect guest, but she also fills a listener request. So we've actually had a couple people request this. You fulfill, you're going to fulfill this, uh, this request with your presence. Mackenzie is a nurse educator, clinical instructor, a a regular nurse, whatever that means. And the subject of today's show, a sexual assault nurse examiner. So that's a long intro, but Hey, Mackenzie, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be here. It's, I'm glad it's to great. Talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been to, we've been working together forever, from when you were a nursing assistant to yeah, like nurse, like because God would so ten I years. To, it, yeah, I was just gonna say I'd have to count it backwards to know how many years for sure, but it's been like a decade. Yeah, I remember I met you when you were working on the burn and trauma unit. Yeah, and um, I'm gonna say something really bad, but we can totally admit to this because we don't do it anymore. We used to sneak outside in the middle of the night on night shift and <laughs> smoke cigarettes. Yeah, but uh, but we saw the error of our ways, and now we work on a pulmonary floor. Now we work on a pulmonary <laughs> floor with lung treatment transplant patients and neither one of us has touched a cigarette for a really long time so it is proof that you can change yeah you can go from uh someone with a bad habit to someone who helps other people to breathe better so <laughs> for sure for sure <laughs> but here we are here we are now and um You actually, I would love for you before we go any further, because our talk, when we get to talking, it goes a number of different ways, but I would love for you to just tell everybody listening a little bit about yourself, whatever you want. I would love to know about your journey through nursing, any personal stuff. I was thinking it would be really fun at the end of every episode to play like two lies and a truth. Oh yeah. But then you got to come back for the next episode to find out what the answer is. (laughs) Oh, nice. There you go. (laughs) It's like I'm working on a given. Sure. But please, but please, you have the floor. Tell us yeah. about yourself. Okay, so nursing was actually not my first career. Um, I went to I went to the University of Iowa and got my undergrad and um, my bachelor's of science in psychology. Had every intention of becoming a clinical psychologist. It was actually like my fourth um, major change in four years, and I still graduated in four years. I just want to say that, like, nice, yeah. right? Nice I'm just gonna go ahead. Yeah. So, um. I, like most nurses, I was pretty ambitious and um, I bit off a bit more than I can chew. My senior year, my um, last semester of my undergrad, I was working in three research labs, doing a thesis, working full time, plus taking advanced calc and advanced stats. I am not good at calc or stats. (laughs) Like math is my scariest. I I really dislike math. Um, And I totally burn myself out. And my mentor was like, you know, maybe you should take some time off before going to grad school. And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. (laughs) And so I started working, I was already working at a substance abuse center here in town as a tech. And um, I did a short stint as a um, director for a intermediate care facility for kids with autism, um, a group home, and then started working as a substance abuse counselor at um, the local treatment center that I had worked at. And um, yeah, and I really enjoyed it um, for a while. (laughs) And then um, I didn't have an, I I didn't have any idea of boundaries. Like, so I I put everything into my work. Um, And so I would work and you did not get paid very well for, um, you know, at nonprofits typically don't. Um, And so I worked so many hours and I, I just really got burnt out. Um, working with that patient population, just getting really frustrated because um, you, you just want to help, you know, you just want to fix and you want to fix and you want to fix. And, um, you know, 
and you can't, you can't always, yeah, yeah. You know, it's really up to individuals. And so um, I decided at that point that I didn't want to do clinical psychology, that that was not um, my, my goal anymore. So then I was looking for new jobs. I started doing research at the university. I was an RA for a, like at that point, it was like a 10, 11 year long um, longitudinal study on Huntington's disease. And I loved it. I did research as an undergrad um, and enjoyed it. But then when I had like every, <laughs> um, every question memorized on all of the cognitive exams, you know, like if someone could give me a cognitive exam, I looked like the most brilliant person in the world <laughs> um, because I just had given them so much. I just got bored mm-hmm. and um, I don't do what I, I kind of noticed every two years I was getting bored with my jobs. So then I was looking at like, what can I do where I won't get bored? Um, I contemplated medicine and I contemplated veterinary. Both of those would have required me to get a whole new undergrad, which I was not interested in doing. And so they had this fantastic program here at the University of Iowa that unfortunately they no longer have, but it was for people who had their degrees in non-nursing fields. You could come in and get your master's in nursing in 18 months. Was it the MNHP? So it it used to be MNHP, but the semester before I started, they changed it to an MSN because Mm -hmm. hospitals had no clue what an MNHP was. They were like, what the hell is that? So yeah, yeah, I've had other people too that are like, that's not a thing. And I'm like, but I thought it was. Yeah. 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 This role is actually the clinical nurse leader. So it was a clinical nurse leader. Um, degree. So you got your master's in nursing, clinical nurse leader. And the clinical nurse leader was the first, it's the first new um, role, nursing role with a and in like 40, 50 years, and something like actually, that. Actually, we'll talk another time because I'm heavily interested in that field of study. So we'll compare yeah. notes later, but please. Fantastic. Continue. Yeah. So um, I applied thinking there's no way I'm going to get bored in nursing. Um, one, if you, and I tell my students this now, if you stop learning, you become unsafe, mm-hmm. right? Like I knew I would always learn and it would challenge me. And I really like learning. I'm kind of a geek, like Me not too. kind of. I'm pretty nerdy. I mean, that's, like, that's one of the things that draws us together is that yeah. we're both nerds for similar things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my first job on Burn, there was a journal club, and I think I was the only nurse that attended. And like <laughs> was super. When I got my first um, academic like journal, you know, I was I got the journal like my first subscription. <laughs> to a peer reviewed journal. I was so excited. It was like the best thing in the world that I had my own subscription um, to that. So that, if that tells you anything. When I I was a student, (laughs) I'll tell you a secret. When I was a student, I used to swipe journals from the hospital that were like laying around the break rooms and stuff. I would bring them back, Uh but I felt like I was doing something like really subversive. But also I was like, you're stealing nursing journals and then returning them. Like, this is the nerdiest crime that's not a crime that's ever like, been committed. Is it really stealing if you bring it back? Well, especially since if anyone had seen me, like, putting them in my bag, they would have been like, whatever. There's, like, a million of them. That's from, like, November of 2012. Like, who cares? <laughs> they probably would have thanked you for cl- clearing up yeah. some of the clutter in the report room. Right. Yeah. Um. So, uh. And then I had this, I had this, um, mis- well, and then the other thing too, is like nursing, like I, if I got bored, I could choose another area, right? I was never stuck in one thing. Mm-hmm. And so being, getting bored every couple of years, like I knew I would be able to, to move around. Um, and I had this really false conception that the schedule was going to be fantastic. <laughs> I'm just, laughing because I'm like, you're not changing jobs anymore. You just keep adding them. I know, I know, I know. Uh, I know. I, you know, my sister was a nurse and she never said anything to me, but I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Three days on, four days off, four days on, three days off. <laughs> BS. Mm-hmm. Like when I first started teaching, I was like, I remember asking the dean, I was like, um, how honest should we be <laughs> about what nursing's like? <laughs> And she goes, no, they'll figure it out on their own. But I don't follow that. Like, I think it's pretty important for people to know up front, like what to expect. So, so yeah. Um, so I got into the program, um, thankfully. And just to let everyone know, 
all my students are really super freaked out about having to get straight A's. I definitely did not have straight A's. <laughs> like, um, yeah, my bachelor's was, you know, it was, I, 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 I put in what effort I needed to, <laughs> but did not like, you know, I did not stress over it. And, so, and you're probably like me and that the stuff that you're actually interested in, you do better at. Whereas right. like the math, let's, let's not lie. I got through the math, right. um, but like other things were more enjoyable. So I'm sure that it's like that for you too. For sure. For sure. Well, and before I actually got diagnosed with my ADD, which happened in grad school, um, like I didn't know how to study. Like I just, I just didn't really do anything. I just went and showed up and did the test or whatever it was. Yeah. I just listened and, you know, it was fine until I got into grad school. So, um, but so yeah, so they got in the program. It was accelerated. It was 18 months. Um, I racked up a crap ton of, um, of student loans because yeah. you couldn't work during it. And then um, my senior internship, my um, one of the instructors who actually ended up being um, my boss asked me if I wanted to work on the burn unit. Um, I, I've always had a really big um, interest in uh, critical care anyway. And the burn unit kind of scared me, not because of burns, but my uh, husband has post-traumatic stress um, disorder from working with burn patients when he was in the military. So coming up on Veterans Day, mm-hmm. I mean, he did three tours to uh, one in Kuwait and two in Iraq. And um, I never quite understood what that felt like. And so my first response went with her is like, well, I'll do it as long as I have someone to process it with. Like, because I can't process at home. Um, and she said, yeah, of course. And so I started up on burn. I still remember the first wound I saw. It was a Fournier's gangrene patient. Like he was debris. He had no scrotum. He was debrided all the way down to his femoral artery. And when we were bathing him, we had to be careful not to like nick the artery. I mean, you could see it pulsating. And most people are like, oh my God. And I was like, that is so cool. So, like I leaned in instead of leaning out. I remember being on burn and there was a Fournier's gangrene patient. And I remember them being like, don't, don't touch. There's an art. And I was like there, what you want me to not touch a what <laughs> so it could have been another patient but this is around the time that i knew you first knew you so it's possible that i know exactly and let me tell you that's in my like top in 20 years 18 years of being in medicine that's like one of the top three terrible things that i've ever <laughs> seen so, yeah, but sorry, I had to stop you because I'm no. like, oh, my God, I took care of that patient. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, you know, it's interesting because we got a lot of foreign skin patients, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, but this as a student, this was the first patient I saw. And um, I just I was like, that is so cool. Uh, you know, so it got to be I loved wounds. I could have my arm up to my elbow in a wound and be perfectly fine. Now, you gave me like mucus, which is funny because I'm on a pulmonary floor now. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's kind of, cr-, you know, like I couldn't deal with trachs, mm-hmm. um, which now it's second nature. But at that time, not so much. So um, so I worked there really in an effort to understand what my husband experienced mm-hmm. um, because I had a hard time empathizing because I didn't quite understand. And so, and then I ended up loving it. So I worked on burn. That was my first job out of nursing school. I did my senior internship up there, or we called it a capstone, um, and then got a job and um, loved it. Uh, That would have been in 2010. And then 2012, a week before my wedding, um, I was doing a patient transfer or patient lift um, that was you know, I remember saying, are you, do you think this is, are you sure this is a good idea? (laughs) Um, Because what we were going to do um, didn't sound ergonomically safe and it wasn't. And um, they were like, well, I think it's best for the patient, but it ended up not being best for me. So I herniated my back um, at that moment. And I didn't know it, um, but the next week when I came back to work, um, like they had to wheel me out on it would like patient escorts had to come up and wheel me out. Cause I was just like, I couldn't move. Um, so getting a work injury, um, that significantly impacted my ability to work, um, on such a heavy floor because mm-hmm. if burn patients take so much physical 
work. Um, you get in really odd positions to do dressings and to do, you know, burn care. And, um, and then on top of that, we did a lot of neck fash cases. So, um, you know, when you have patients who, um, you know, have huge wounds and can't be mobile, um, it was, it was really, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. At that time, then the teamwork kind of started going downhill. We had some changes um, in administration. And um, I always tell my students, like, the two things you need to look at when you're getting a job isn't the skills, like what it takes to learn. You'll learn that on the job. That's not a big deal. You need to look at your patient population. Do I enjoy the type of patients I'm working with and the teamwork? Like shadow a floor, listen to the nurses, listen to the NAs. How do they talk to each other? How do they work together? Because your life, I mean, your career can be drastically impacted by the team. This is not a this is not a solo sport. It's totally a team sport. Um, and you will be miserable if you don't have good teamwork on your own. I 100% agree. You can have the same patient assignment two nights in a row and two different teams yield two different types of nights. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, sometimes a good team has a bad night, but a good team is going to make a bad night not as bad. So sure. I completely agree with that. Listen to, and you know, in those interviews, I tell people to ask, what's the turnover like? Mm-hmm. What's the teamwork like? What's the morale like? Why do people leave this floor? You can, you can interview them too a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. And you should, Yeah. right? Like I, people shouldn't be afraid of asking those questions. And usually if staff are unhappy, I'll tell you, they'll let you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and, but the same with being happy, you know, it's like our unit that we work on now. Like, I love the team, you yeah. know, um, and I, I think that it's a good sign, you know, when um, when people stay a long time and those that don't stay usually are leaving for advanced degrees, leaving the state. So it's really nice when people aren't leaving because they hate. They hate the unit. So yeah, we have we have a really great team. And people that have gone to travel have like communicated back to us and said, like, this is this is a special unit. So I I say that all the time. Since the beginning of this show, I've said like I I'm lucky. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. There's not a time where I come in and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm breathing a little too hard. <laughs> um, Heavy breather. Uh, where I say, Oh, I gotta work with that person. There's yeah. not there, you know, I, I don't have that. So that's pretty spectacular. Anyway, t- the teamwork on burn was not like that. Um, mm-hmm. It was, it, it was for a while and there have been patches of time that it has been like that, but it's true when the, when the tide turns, it sometimes turns really hard. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it was just the combination of not having the teamwork I needed and having an injury. Um, it was, it was just too much. So I was looking for a new job and I was looking at ICU. I had an interest in pal- because of what I saw on burn. I had a whole new um, interest in palliative medicine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking actually at the hospices, like the local hospices, um, but the pay decrease was s- substantial. So um, at that time, the, the dean from the College of Nursing um, for undergrad um, contacted me and said, hey, do you want to start teaching? And so I wasn't even that even in nursing school, Adrian. I remember saying those who can't do teach. <laughs> uh, like I'm eating my That's words. That's not right? true in nursing. No, not even not. a little bit. No, I, you know, it was just you know, short sighted of me at that time. It's amazing how much I've grown. <laughs> um, but uh when she offered teaching, I was like, we, I just found out I was pregnant with my first daughter um, or my first kid, my only daughter. And it was no more nights, no more weekends, no more holidays, nine months a year. Mm-hmm. Sign me up for that shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like, get me off the floor. Like um, I'm ready for this. And so I started teaching and I did hundred percent for the college of nursing um, for the university. Um, my first semester before I went on to maternity leave <laughs> And um, it was nice, but I missed bedside nursing, right? Um, it was an adjustment. I was used to taking, I always precepted when I was on the floor. I always took new nurses. Um, I, I like learning. I like, you know, like, I don't know. It, and I if always you like enjoy. to learn, you usually like, like to share what you learn, which sharing what you learn is just teaching. Right. 
I was on an education major on one of those four majors. So, you know. <laughs> By the yeah. way, I just have to interrupt to say that I was about to be annoyed thinking Doug had a movie playing loudly in the next room. I just realized that I had a movie playing on my desktop. <laughs> So I don't think my mic picked that up, but if you guys have been listening to the last like 20 minutes of Under the Tuscan Sun, I hope you enjoyed it. (laughs) So I just, I'm sorry. I didn't get to hear it. Nothing but professionalism here. Yeah. If I heard it, I would probably like my ADD would have kicked in. I was like, oh. (laughs) Maybe maybe that's what made me go, oh, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. I was teaching today and I saw someone's shoes and I was like, I was like in the middle of teaching. I was like, wow, I love those shoes. What kind of shoes are those? I was like, shiny things. Um, But but you really are. You're um, so I'm glad that you were able to like bust into the world of education because we need teachers like you. And that's thanks. I could tell you you suck if you, I wanted to because you're my friend, but you don't. So I don't have to worry about telling you. Thanks. Yeah. So I guess I'll speed it up too. Uh, so uh, I, they eventually let us do a split. So a year after teaching, they let us split. And that's how I ended up on rescue. Mm-hmm. So they let us do um, a percentage with, so we could stay bed, bedside and stay current on our practice. So uh, I ended up on rescue because they had the palliative unit. I had no interest in doing actually respiratory stuff. It was just the palliative portion of care that I wanted to do. And I ended up loving both. Yeah. Um, And then come to this role, uh, I had actually heard about um, the SANE role when I was in nursing school. Mm -hmm. And they had someone come and talk, I think, in our public health rotation or class. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was like, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then, because I'm really not great at follow through all the time, I would say, hey, who do I need to contact for that? And they tell me a name and I'd forget, <laughs> you know, you or like write, write it down. I forget where I put my and throw it away. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and yeah. And then lose my post-it note. And so um, a little over a year ago, um, going on a year, two years, I, time kind of blends. Um, we actually got an email from the coordinator um, trying to recruit. And I was like, I don't have an excuse anymore because all I have to do is hit reply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I hit reply um, and interviewed and got a role. And, and uh, so, yeah. So on top of being a staff nurse and a faculty, I am also, like you said, a, sexual assault nurse examiner, which I can't say sane yet technically because I am not certified. Okay. Um, so that's when, when you can condense it to an acronym is when you know you've really made it. Like Got you've it. gotten enough hours in. So let's, let's break this down a little bit because this is actually a topic that, like I said, multiple people have messaged me wanting to know more about this. This is a certification on top of your nursing license. Um, and so we you talk a little bit more about what and I always want to say say nurse but that's like saying pin number it's already in the name um but I'm just going to warn people it's just natural for me to say sane nurse so because if I say so what's it take to be a sane it just it sounds weird so I'll just warn you guys I'm probably going to say that more than I mean to but so what what is a what is a sane what is a sane so um you mean, how do you become a sane or what do we do? I think there are some people that like literally don't know what a sexual assault nurse examiner does. Like, how is it different than a regular, a regular nurse, quote unquote? Um, What, what makes it a certification? What is it that you guys do? Sure. If you're looking at a big umbrellas, a sane role would fall under like forensic nursing. So, um, you are the one who's collecting the specimens uh, from a victim uh, to potentially uh, connect a perpetrator to. So um, literally collecting evidence after a sexual assault. Correct. Yes. Uh, so people will come. We have um, you know, typically uh, five days where we can still potentially find DNA um, that we can do. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. And then also we only have like three days to start MPEP when MPEP is um, uh, HIV prophylaxis and AIDS prophylaxis. So, um, but if someone's assaulted, we, and I I would just want to say, I want to encourage anyone, 
even if you're like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I, please just come in um, because um, we can at least set you up uh, with resources um, at the very least, even if you don't want a, a um, exam done. You know, we work really closely. The the so SART is the sexual assault response team, and that's um, a kind of a broader umbrella that includes um, our VAP, so the Rape Victims Advocacy Program, mm-hmm. and then um, like Johnson County um, attorneys, um, the police station, you know, the police, um, all those people who kind of work on this team together. Sure. Um. So, yeah. Um. As far as skills wise, you have to learn how to be really conscious about what you're doing because you don't want to contaminate evidence. Mm-hmm. Right? So you have to be really cautious about, you know, where your DNA is. <laughs> um, and, oh, yeah. 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 I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Um, and you just have to be, you know. I guess detailed as possible, you know, so if you're looking at injuries and you're like describing things, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you catch things. So not only does a patient get the care that they need, but if it were to go to K, if they wanted to press charges um, or to go to court, then they have the best, um, the best chance, the best chance. The evidence is the most detailed. Right. And I think that um, w- another thing that you were starting to talk about that's very important is even if someone eventually chooses not to report, which let me just, I want to back up for a second because I wrote down a few statistics because one of the things that, you know, some people are not aware of this role and some people may say, well, like, why, why do we need this? And from a, a report from 2010 from the NAT. Uh, National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Nearly one in five women in the United States have been raped, uh, an overwhelming number of them before the age of 25, an even larger number before the age of 18. And also, you know, while men are a smaller percentage, it's also like 2% of all men in the United States have been assaulted. Um, And 63% of sexual assaults are not reported. And on college campuses, it's even higher. It's like greater than 90%. And so not only are these not being reported and prosecuted, there's a whole other system of bullshit that we won't have time to conquer and solve today. But the other thing is, is that like you were saying, HIV prophylaxis, STI, uh, you know, testing, pregnancy prophylaxis. um, There's all sorts of things, fucking counseling because my God. So um, yeah, hooking women up with resources. So it's not all just evidence, but that sounds like a huge part of it. Um, are you usually first contact, like, are you one of the first healthcare providers to come into contact with these patients? Yes and no. So typically what happens is they um, come into, most often they come into one of the emergency departments. So whether it be the University, of, we serve Johnson County. And so uh, whether it be the University of Iowa or Mercy, we go to either one. And from there, the hospital contacts our VAP, so the Rape Victims Advocacy Program. And the person who's on call there will then contact the, the SANE who's on call. Um, and then we will go there and, and meet um, with the victim and um, just see what they want to do. So I, the victim, they, they are always the captain of the ship right? They get to determine what they want to have done, what they don't want to have done. Uh, They get to completely direct their care, right? Um, We feel it's really important. Like so much of their control has already been taken away um, that we don't want to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure. And so, like you said, it's not just like even HIV prophylaxis. We actually don't test for STIs because... um, It takes weeks before that. But we do do prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So we do give medications um, to prevent um, STIs. We give medication for the most common ones. We give medications to um, prevent pregnancy if if someone wants to do that. Um, We, you know, we have all of these services. And then just to make sure, yeah, like they're connected with counseling or they, you know, um, if they want to want to report, then we can, you know, um, connect them with that too. You know, it's just, there's so many services. And it? So it sounds like you're guiding them kind of through a multidisciplinary system here. 
that's set yeah. up to help these survivors. Yeah. You know, I, I want to say RVAP plays a huge role with, mm-hmm. um, with victims of sexual assault. So they're really a mate, like a huge player in making sure that these victims are able to get what they need or get what they want. Um, we kind of do the medical side of it. So we make sure that they get the medications they want mm-hmm. um, or need uh, the care that they need. If they were injured, you know, um, we, it's important, you know, if someone was strangled during their assault um, that we make sure that we get them CT, you know, get them what care they want. But with that said, the, the patient, the victim can always decide like, I want this or I don't want this. And they don't have to make that decision just once. Right. So, you know, if we're going through it and they're okay with, um, certain swabs, but they don't want to do a speculum exam. That's okay. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever they feel comfortable with. And you're right. A lot of times people come in and it's, it's, people always think that rapes happen with strangers and more often than not, it's people, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times, especially when people, you know, if there was drinking, because college campuses, right. If there's drinking involved, there's so much self-blame right? Like, well, if I wasn't drinking or if I wasn't here, or if I didn't, you know, and the truth is it doesn't matter the circumstances. It wasn't right. Right. No one deserves to be assaulted. And, you know, you need to advocate. For, I don't want to say advocate for, but you know, like get the help you need and let us advocate for you, yeah. you know, if, if you can't do it for yourself. Um, but it's so, it's, um, really sad. One statistic you didn't throw out, and I don't have exact numbers, but a huge population of the LGBTQIA um, community ha- is significant for sexual assaults. Which is also significant because this is also a community that doesn't necessarily feel safe seeking out health care for regular stuff, right. not to mention traumatic things like assault. Um, And so I think it's really important that communities have programs. And so I'm going to, in the show notes, I'm definitely, and as we talk, there'll be more things that I'll write down to include. Even though we're in Southeast Iowa, there are resources throughout the country, including national resources to help people deal with these fucking crimes that are committed against them essentially. So I think it's, I think it's important. And I think it says a lot to you because this is a very like detail oriented forensic based skill based profession or job. But at the same time, you need to, again, be sensitive to the needs of your patient, what they've been through, what they are Because, you know, anytime anything like that happens, there's a a million emotions that I can't even imagine. (laughs) But um, it's important that we encourage them to seek help, but also be understanding that, like, not everybody processes things at the same speed or in the same way. So, um, for sure. A lot of victims, like, will say, you know, like, I'm so, I don't remember. I'm so sorry. And that's so normal. Like, as we mm-hmm. process trauma, you know, I always let them know, like, you know, it may be days or weeks, and you might, more memories might come back, you know, more mm-hmm. things like, oh, I forgot about that. I, you know, that's just like our, our brain does a good job of trying to protect us, you know, um, it, through trauma. And, and I think one of the things that is so often left out, you know, we know about the fight or flight response, but there's the fight, flight or freeze response. And that's really important. So, yeah, it's true that you don't always have the normal fight or flight response. Sometimes that freeze response includes your ability to remember it, process it, talk about it. Um, and so many challenges that comes with this kind of nursing, I know. Right. So... I- how, so you got you got this email. You connected with. Was this through public health or, or for, through RVAP? You said that they contacted. No, or? this actually was. So the university, the College of Nursing, kind of houses oh, yeah, yeah. saying, you know. So um, at the time, um, Laura Johns was the coordinator, and she had sent out an email. Um, and then um, now Katie Rasmussen is is our new coordinator. Um, Laura's still Who on the I team. I also used to work with when I was a nurse. Yeah, assistant. she's six JC. Yeah, I think both. Well, and they were both um, SNCU. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I... I met with Laura and talked about it. She kind of told what the expectations are. Um, and... 
said, yeah, we'd have, we'd be happy to have you join our team. And so started their process. Nice. Um, yeah. So what was the training like? So ours, it was, um, kind of an interesting time because the university, our university wasn't doing, um, hands-on training at the time. So we ended up getting connected with the Des Moines program and they have a really large program. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, which for those that don't know Iowa, that's like a couple hours West, which is like what, six hours West of Chicago, just to give, just to give our listeners kind of a, a place in the world. Yeah. It's our capital. It is the capital of Iowa. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like the Des Moines. The Des Moines. Yes. <laughs> they grow a lot of potatoes. Um, <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. We don't. Do, we don't do a lot of potatoes in Iowa. <laughs> Idaho. We're a corn and soybeans. Yeah. 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 Yep. And beef. <laughs> beef and pigs. And beef. Beef and pigs. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> I was like, everyone's like, where's Iowa? I'm like, oh, the potatoes. No. No. So, yeah. Idaho. Oh, the Buckeye yeah. State. No, that's yeah. Ohio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the other one in between those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah, Forensics 515 is, is the group out of um, Des Moines. And so we did our training the first 40 hours online. Uh, which was really nice. So we, it was kind of um, self-study. We had a, a specific time, um, you know, uh, scope of time that we had to finish our training. But then we would turn in assignments. Like I remember, uh, you know, like uh, sending pictures of our assignments or turn them in and uh, to show that we were doing it. And then we had um, speculum training. So we, uh, I, went into the University of Iowa Women's Health Clinic and actually shadowed Michelle Root. So I don't think she's with the university anyway, anymore, but she's she was a nurse practitioner for the University of Iowa and she was phenomenal. She was my own practitioner for a period of time, which is always interesting to work, you know, see the flip side, yeah, you know, yeah. like, oh, you see me personally, like really personally. I, I, same, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I used to work with my doctor too. So yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, so went in for speculum training and um, I... It, it was, I really am thankful for the patients who, you know, allow us to practice putting speculums in there mm-hmm. and, and, and in them and um, identifying their cervix. I, you know, and I also have to say IUDs are fantastic because you know exactly where the cervix is. There's like no guessing like, Oh, there it is. Oh, all of these is. things are true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually was part of that patient program when I was like 18. Really? Maybe not for sane nurses, but we had medical students um, that would come over to uh, the Emma Goldman Clinic when I worked there. So wonderful. Yeah. Ages ago. That was a weird experience. But you know what? It's all it's all for learning. It's all for educating uh, healthcare professionals. So some somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Well, and these were actually patients in the clinic coming in for their oh, got it. normal so like, as like volunteers as yeah. like. Well, we eventually did that. So, but oh, at yeah, this yeah. point, because the university wasn't like um, the program here wasn't doing hands on, so we would just get connected um, with um, someone in women's health, and we went to, and it was just like people's general gynecology exams. So they weren't expecting someone just to, you know. But we're a teaching hospital, so most mm-hmm. patients of the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics are used to stu- like residents or students um, coming in and participating in their care. They're always allowed to say no. Um, but so I was able to do a number of those. And then we did a ride along with the police officer to find out kind of like their role, um, which was interesting. I didn't get to do anything exciting. There was like no like fast car chases. <laughs> uh, I did try to learn a little bit more about how their speed, like their speed gun works. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, what point do you guys really look at like pulling someone over? Like, like not know. saying me, yeah. just in, just in, in, yeah. in theory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't so, speed. No, no, never. <laughs> I think that was at the time maybe where I actually had two speeding t- tickets. They were like, the we year. you up, yeah. honey. We know, yeah. we, know yeah, what we, you're, know. we know what you're, what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, got to do that. And then it was um, other stuff. So whether it be like um, reading research or going to conferences or, you know, just a variety of things to make up our other 40 hours um, that had sure. to do directly with sexual assault. And then when it came to cases, we had to observe too. 
um, with someone who's already been a sane and then um, be observed for our third. And then after that, we can practice. Interesting. Okay. I also and it's all start, on call, obviously. It's all on call. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did go do a training in Des Moines where we did have volunteers for patients. So they kind of ran us through um, like a different variety of patients and, and um, te- different tests that we would take or specimens that we would take. Sure. And so had that experience as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so it the hard part for me was kind of like... Um, my cases were really kind of far in between because I have two small kids at home. And so with my husband being a nurse, it was kind of trying to figure out when I had someone home to be with Mm -hmm. the kids Mm because I can't leave a six and a two year old home or at that time was, um, you know, six and one or under one Mm -hmm. or five and one Carolyn. Carolyn has continued to get older also. So she was, <laughs> she doesn't just stay at six. She's just six. She, you know, she's just She'll six. Be six. She's just six. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, then I got my training in and, and uh, yeah, I've been and practicing on my own for at least a year. And um, what are the continuing education things like what's what's that like so actually no continuing ed as far as my role now now if i want to get certified i um you have to have four hour 400 hours doing work as a sexual assault nurse examiner to be able to take the certification exam and then honestly i'm not sure on the the ceus after that but you know what people can always go to their state board of nursing because it's going to vary from state to state and it's potentially entirely different in other countries um but yeah board of nursing is where to look for things like this they'll tell you all about everything from how to renew to how to apply what what their po box number is so look to your state board of nursing for that yeah and i and I would say too, just you can look at like the forensic nursing, you know, the, the, um, oh, they should be able to give you all the information. And also, because the- if you look at the same certification, mm-hmm. like the group who does that will probably be able to give you a better idea of like how to study, like what other stuff you have to study for, for the exam, how often you have to get recertified, those kinds of things. So it's kind of like your PCCN or your C- uh, CCRN, you know, like all of those certifications. Yeah. It's similar to that. So would you recommend that nurses that are considering this have a little bit of bedside experience or is this one of those roles that a new nurse wants to help out totally go for it? Like, would you say that, that that's, yeah, I, I think a, a new nurse could totally, to, could totally do this route, um, this role. It's, you know, as far as nursing, we're not doing blood draw, you know, we're not doing some of those things. I mean, it's specialized, right? So you're doing speculums, you're doing swabs. It's more so just being mindful. But you're not good at IVs. This is not, this doesn't it matter. matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Because actually we can't do those things. The nurses, so they'll have, when they come into the ED, they'll have a physician through the ED or an, or an LIP, right? And then they'll have their own nurse. And the nurse, at least for our program, the nurse will administer the medication. We'll tell them what we need ordered. So you're but, just there for the forensic aspect and the specialized interaction with the patient. Correct. Correct. When it comes to the actual like administration of medications or drawing of labs, those things, the emergency department does that. Or whoever the nurse is, if they're in inpatient, wherever they are, um, the nurse will do that. Um, yep. So have you ever been called upon to follow up in court or anything like that with any patients? I haven't. Um, I do know that um, a number of our sayings have, but I haven't had that experience. We do get special training though. So sometimes we'll get um, some like webinars um, or, um, well, now Zoom, everything's Zoom, but uh, where attorneys will come and they'll practice with us or like they'll tell you kind of like, you know, um, things that they're looking for and um, how to present um, data. Because basically when you come to court, you're you're acting as a, um, I'm going to lose my words a specialist, right? Like you're, you know, when you look watch like SVU or like law and mm-hmm. order, right. like you're the, you're the specialist that they're calling on to say, you know, 
your medical, we, right? Your, your medical expertise, your, your expert. Yes. You're the expert witness. There we go. There, you, oh. there we go. You're I mean, the and I'm not making light of this, but this is a very cool job. You have an opportunity to have an impact on people's lives. Um, and and I, I wish we were in a society where it was likely that, uh, you know, we could we could handle these things in ways that are conducive to not re-victimizing our survivors over and over again. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a huge issue. And, you know, without obviously we could go on for ages about this issue and problems and solutions to it. But um, I think that keeping it honed into just this role is very interesting because this is just like any other job. Like there are a lot of emotions. We hear about a lot of stories that um, are patient situations that really are heartbreaking make us feel terrible. And so like you were saying, you can't go home from the burn unit and debrief with your husband because of the experiences and the way he processes those. What kind of support debriefing do you have? I mean, I know this isn't something that you've done a ton, Mm -hmm. um, but what are some caretaker... Who's taking care of the caretakers, I guess? Yeah, really, it's the team. Right. So we actually have our sane meeting tonight at six. And so, um, you know, using those other people who understand, you know, it's kind of like when you're talking to non nurses about your problems as a nurse, like they just don't understand. Yeah. And so, um, really using this, the other people that are on your team and talking about it. So we have monthly meetings where everyone's like, does anyone want to talk about a case? I know that if I had a case that was really disturbing to me, I could reach out to any of my saying, my fellow sayings and say, Hey, I really just need to talk about this or like talk to Katie, my director, or, you know, I have some people who I, I know a little bit more um, and just talk about it. I know there was one case that I had um, when I was still in training and it was really tough. It was really like, um, it was a really tough case and it was actually Katie. We went out afterwards and, you know, had, a, had a beverage and just like, you know, just kind of, just process you just process. It. Yeah. And I find that in these circumstances, you may go there, excuse me, I have carb- carbonation burps because I'm a <laughs> professional podcaster. <laughs> Um, but yeah, in these, in these kind of like debriefings, you may have the intention of like blowing off some steam and processing through whatever this is, but it ends up going a million different directions. You laugh, you cry, you laugh again, then you cry some more and then, you know, then you go home and you feel a little better. Um, but the other nice thing about debriefing, as long as you're not in a crowded restaurant (laughs) for, for multiple reasons, but also is that when you're debriefing with your team, you you're able to talk about things that you can't talk about because of HIPAA. Right. Um, so there's that protection as well, mm-hmm. but yeah, I've got to make sure you're not talking about it in the line at, at the grocery right. store, you know? Right. Well, what I want to say too, debriefing doesn't usually, for me, it doesn't have to do with the patient details, right? It's my it's emotional, response. my response to it. Yeah. Like how am I feeling about it? Um, true. Yeah. Cause I think nurses, we don't get into nursing because we, or not emotion, you know, like we, yeah. we care. Right. And sometimes our empathy can, can, um, you know, lead to burnout. And so I think talking about like, man, that was really tough for me. Like it was really hard. Like, you know, it was hard trying to talk them through this or like not knowing what to say when mm-hmm. they were, you know, and just really talking about our experience from our experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I find is, is the most helpful versus rehashing every bit of thing That's from the true. patient. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. so what advice would you have for nurses at any stage in their career who are interested in pursuing this kind of nursing, this very specialized role among the nursing community? What, what advice would you give just general general tips. I say just reach out to your, t- really, I think there's such a need for this role. Um, I mean, especially we, we need more nurses. I, I'm sure every community, cause it's not a job people want, right? right. It's not like <laughs> people don't grow up and say, I'm going to do. Yeah. Maybe yeah. some do, but n- not a lot, not a lot. 
and not for the, you know, it's, I always, this is going to still sound horrible, but when I was a burn nurse, I was like, oh, it's burn season. Yes. You know, like, I don't want anyone to get burned. No, but, but like, that was my specialty. Tra- trauma and ICU nurses, they, they like to see interesting things. Right. No, we so, don't wish it upon anybody, but yeah. Right. But that's where you shine. You right. That was your time to shine. Yeah. I will never say, oh yes, it's sexual assault season. Right. Like right. that's not something that's ever going to come out of my mouth. Um, I, I prefer to not have to do this job. Right. <laughs> but for me, I have a skill set, right? Like I'm I'm a good nurse. I'm a little I don't think I'm a type A personality, but when it comes to nursing stuff, like I'm quite particular, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm detail oriented and I have the ability. Um, I'm pretty good with like the mental health aspect, right? Like, um, and not everyone has, has those skills. So to me, it's not, if you want to make money, this isn't the place to come. Um, for me, it's my service to my community, mm-hmm. right? I have these skills and um, I can help someone with my skills. So that, that's where I come from. So I, I'd say, you know, if you have even the desire to even like, like, I'm not sure what this is, reach out to the coordinator, you know, like reach out to someone who you know who does it or, um, you know, any of those things and just, or RVAP and they can connect you. Like it, because even if you if if you have the thought in your mind like I might want to do that, chances are you're the right kind of person to do it, yeah. right? Um, because it's not like I said, it's not anything that people are like, ooh, like I want to you know see people right. when they're you know, um, yeah, after they've been assaulted, yeah. right? <laughs> you know. So I think I think that's a valid point. I think that when you have this special skill set, that it's important to at least at least listen to that inkling, um, and then. Uh, if people, I know that we do have some listeners that are inside Johnson County. Um, if people want to contact or f- get on the path to discovering this for themselves here in town or here in Johnson County, who would they contact? Yeah. So our coordinator right now is Katie Rasmussen. So you can email her and it's, there are multiple like Katie's or Catherine. So don't do Catherine Rasmussen. Someone has, I, I apologize to a Catherine Rasmussen at U Iowa. Cause she has been getting my emails. I will link it. I will okay. link it everywhere. There is information about this episode. So perfect. Yeah. Um, so- I will make sure that it's there. Perfect. So Katie, Katie, K-A-T-Y Rasmussen, she's our coordinator right now, but also really cool, a whole bunch of old ladies that are trying to manage like social media. We do have um, the Facebook page that is um, JC, so Johnson County, JC Sart, S-A-R-T, Iowa uh, for Facebook. And then for the Instagram, it's um, JC dot Sart. It's a capital J. And I'll, put, I'll, I'll put, put it all. I'll put it all there. Fantastic. So but if you go to those places, one, you'll find out kind of what's going on. But two, you could always like drop a message and then Katie can, you know, either email her or whatever. And she, cause she's the one that's going to get you into your training. Um, tell you a little bit more about expectations, all of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're feeling like you want to do it, just know like usually what we want people to do is, or what they ask of us is six to eight on-call shifts a month. Um, and they can be split up. You know, we usually do from, um, like six in the morning until five at night and then five to six kind of Mm -hmm. somewhere roughly around there, but, um, we can split it up, but just if you're not, you know, when you're on call, you just have to be available within, um, we usually say like 20 to 30 minutes Mm -hmm. of being able to get into the ED and, um, and a lot of times you don't get called in, thankfully. Yeah. Um, it's like that job that nobody wants to have to do, but you want to have somebody available if it's necessary. Exactly. I exactly. mean, wouldn't all nurses love to be put out of business? But um, in the meantime, there are people that very much need uh, quality, compassionate care. So. For sure. For sure. Well. Yeah. No, any any no. parting thoughts? I just was gonna thank oh. you. This is like so much information. I oh, knew good. I t- about this. Okay. No, this is fantastic. Yeah, you did ask earlier if men can be saying 
Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it it would make sense that like not all uh, victims or not all survivors of sexual assault are women and nor do all survivors of sexual assault want female practitioners. So, um, yeah. So anyone can be a mm-hmm. saying. Um, we have had someone who's um, transgender. Um, you know, there is a potential we would give a victim like the opportunity to say if they were comfortable or not, you right. know. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so because it, it's kind of hard to say like, well, only male say would take male patients because you're on call. That's true. Um, That's very true. Like you, but, don't get, you don't get to pick necessarily. But. Right. But that could be a conversation between you and Kate, like or between you and the coordinator, mm-hmm. wherever you, you're you living. You yeah. know, um, don't let your gender or your or gender, gender identity. Expression. Yeah. Um, stop you. Prohibit you. Stop, yeah. yeah. Stop mm-hmm. you from, from pursuing this role. Like. Excellent. It's, it's an equal opportunity employer. Good. And, you know, yet one of those other millions of opportunities in nursing that we have to make a difference with, um, I, I just, I love that you have all these, I, I say all of these, but I just, I love that you're varied, um, your, your, the work you do, the trajectory through your profession. I really have enjoyed the time I've spent working with you. I look forward to it as a night shifter. I mostly see you when I am winding down and getting ready to hand off my patients to day shift. And you are showing up with your students. And as I'm running around, so this is funny, I have to tell people about this because this is our dynamic. This is what happens um, when Mackenzie shows up to the unit. She comes in, what, like 6.30 in the morning, check out the patient board, see what assignments you can give your, you know, who you can partner your students up with. And here I come creeping with bags, specimen bags with blood tubes in them going, do your students have my patients? Patients? Would they like to draw these labs so I don't have to? And so, and then, and then it's funny because throughout the rest of the morning until I leave, I see nurses coming to you going, do your students want to do this thing that I am supposed to do right? It's a, so we become vultures. We're like, students, students, who wants skills? Who wants skills? So I just think that's really funny that whenever I see you, I'm like, don't pounce McKenzie with skills. <laughs> that or people always pounce me for questions because, you know, sometimes I think people automatically assume like when you're an educator, you, you know, know everything. everything. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the other thing I say. If you think you know everything in healthcare, you're unsafe no, right you there's no there's no way you can know everything no. um but yeah there's a lot of times where i'm like i don't know <laughs> like, i don't know <laughs> that's the beauty of nursing is that like we are taught that even when we don't know we can fi- we can figure it out we'll ask somebody else we'll look it up there's got to be a journal article about it there's something we will find it so for sure for sure Excellent. well yeah. thank you so much for joining me mckenzie yeah. this is fun i love having friends on the show but um you're a special kind of friend because i've known you for so dang long it's oh, like you know it's ridiculous when you get to a point where you're counting back in decades not yeah. years you know <laughs> like i'm feeling old um, yeah but like uh, older older but yeah no this is fantastic it's so fun because i've seen you through your career and you've seen me through my career mm-hmm. it's it's been cool we've come we've come we've come a long way and it'll be interesting to see what we've done with our careers in another 10 i'll meet you back here in 10 how about that fantastic that sounds great and i end every show wishing everybody the same thing happy nursing